This month's Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by eight amazing people. Greg Ross, Illuminati, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Michael Fritschke, Dr. O in Teberg, and Doug Malam. Thank you all so very much for helping make this show possible. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight, finally, I have with me Mr. Marty Garza. Hey, Marty. How you doing? How you doing, Soraya? Um, we, we've talked online and we got to talk once on the, uh, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, but, uh, this is the first time you've been on this show. Yeah. I'm excited to be on here. I know we have a lot of shared interests. Yeah. Yeah. Including metal. Yeah, exactly. Your, your <laughs> username is one of my favorite metal bands, Overkill. <laughs> Big surprise there. Yeah. You know, and I'm, I'm a monster truck guy, you know, as some, as some of your listeners may know. And, uh, you know, our uh, theme song for my team is actually Overkilled. <laughs> by uh, motorhead oh nice nice um so uh for people who aren't familiar with you which means they they're not listening to the brothers of the serpent podcast you've been doing a a multi-part series on ufos with them uh which i kind of put up there with our ufo history series with with mike and aaron here in that it it kind of just keeps going and uh has has not lost any momentum uh, you keep bringing very interesting stuff out, and you're you're making some really interesting connections. Do you want to tell anyone a little bit about your background? Well, you know, my I guess my uh, my persona, <laughs> my uh, off air persona is uh, that of a, a you know, like I said, a monster truck background. I'm the, I'm actually in the monster truck hall of fame. I, I, oh, uh, I'm responsible for a lot of the engineering principles that are used on. Uh, modern day monster trucks, you know, so we work for monster jam and a lot of big promotion companies and been world champion and all, you know, so pretty, pretty well accomplished in that field. But, you know, my other personality, I guess you could say being a Gemini is, uh, I've had an interest in the phenomenon, um, actually my whole life, um, for various reasons. Uh, but I delved in, I began delving into it seriously um, probably by the late eighties, early nineties, um, and, and became, you know, very deeply involved in, in research. And, um, I was actually an admin for, uh, the television, the television show, there was a television show by Fox in the, uh, early mid nineties called Encounters. Mm. Um, and I was an admin for them, uh, online for, for, for a number of years and, uh, MUFON investigator and all. And then I kind of, um, I wouldn't say became disillusioned, but my interests, you know, kind of turned into in different areas. And um, when I returned to it uh, more seriously, I kind of came back with a, a different perspective, I guess you could say. Early on, all I would say the first decade of so, or so of my, you know, in-depth uh, research was very nuts and bolts based. Right. Um, I had a, a you know, being in, you know, in engineering and all, I, I had a, a keen interest in the mechanical side of it, right? You know, the propulsion side. Right. But um, as I said, stepping away from it for a little while and then coming back in with fresh eyes, I began to recognize that there was a lot more going on that was kind of being filtered out. Yeah. Um, and and I think that that has drastically changed um, the way I perceive what what I think is a, a much stranger and broader um, phenomenon than what most people would ever consider, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think the problem is we try to fit it into these little boxes and it just doesn't fit. Yeah, absolutely. The um, And it, it it's with all this paranormal stuff. And you, you cover a lot of this. You go into the esoteric, the magical realms of stuff, um, you know, talking about the, the similarities between some of those experiences. And that's what kind of got me into, into thinking about it that way is that practicing magic, I was having these experiences. And then I'm reading, I think, Transformation, and I'm going, why is Streber having experiences that kind of look like mine, but have aliens instead of like shadows? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, 
there's definitely an overlay, a cultural overlay or a perceptual overlay based on your background. Yeah. Um, yet the, the phenomenology of it is all seems to follow very specific patterns. Um, and we tend to use labels to name, um, you know, to place on whatever it is that we're experiencing. But I think sometimes those labels can be off-putting or or mischaracterize what is what might actually be going on. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I think that that, you know, uh, th I guess this gets into could be a complex discussion in, in that regard in that um, what happens, I guess, more often than not, is people use contemporary events to try to unravel, uh, you know, an, <laughs> an ages long, you know, a mystery. And yeah. I think what happens is when you're when you're trying to interpret things based on current events, you don't have sufficient uh, background to really understand and see the patterns. And we tend to take I think more often than not, people take their experiences at, at face value. And I think that's there's a huge danger in that in of misinterpretation. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things I've always said is that whatever this stuff is, it's been with us cross culture throughout history. So it, it seems silly to say that it doesn't exist or it's people's imagination because there, there's traces of it everywhere. Uh, if nothing else, it's a human experience. Uh, but the problem is it doesn't tell us what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, you know, I always tell tell people, I go, whenever somebody tells you that they have it all figured out, I go, yeah. that's when you know they're full of it. You know, yes. like <laughs> this is, a, you know, literally a, a, a mystery as old as time itself. And I don't think that, it's quite so simple that somebody could just sit down and look at a few things and go, okay, I, I think I see what's going on here. It's like, no, just when you think you have it figured out, it's going to throw you for a loop completely. And then, oh, yeah. and then add to that, the disinformation involved, you know, the, yeah. the, the various, you know, agencies involved in this that are purposely um, misleading people or sending people out on, you know, wild goose chases. And, you know, and that, that's been kind of a, a primary contention I've been making on the uh, on this on our, you know, Brothers of the Serpent series is that, you know, I'm firmly of the belief that when when you look at the, 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 the documented history of the phenomenon and how this has been addressed by the various government agencies, it is pretty clear that from almost the beginning of the modern UFO, you know, UFO era, which, you know, most people would would consider that 1947, the Kenneth Arnold sighting or Roswell on. And I think that almost from that date, at least 1950 or so, there was a concerted effort to give the public a binary choice. Either yeah. they were aliens or they didn't exist. And I think that was a false choice and, that was seated, you know. And and so much you get that from like people who don't really look into this stuff. They'll be like, "Oh, you you believe in the UFOs, so so you believe in aliens?" And it's like, well, eh, that's not a simple question, you know. <laughs> like it's not binary. I can yeah, be I can believe some of those people could be, you know, they could be religious people. <laughs> like you're contradicting yourself, <laughs> right? you're, you know. You're being hypocritical. <laughs> But it's it, it's it's either you know when they ask if you believe in UFOs they mean do you believe in nuts and bolts aliens coming here not do you believe there's a UFO phenomena exactly they've been entrained into thinking that way right that it's a binary choice and the same with things like Bigfoot you know do you, do you believe in Bigfoot basically means do you believe there's a hairy undiscovered ape in the woods it's like I'm not sure about that but I'm pretty sure there's a phenomena happening. Right. And then the more you study it, you find that it that even that phenomenon is much stranger than what oh, the yeah. common public perception is of it. You know, and then you get into, of course, you know, all the other, you know, lore, you know, angels and demons and fairies and gnomes and you know, all yep. these other even, you know, ghosts and all sorts of paranormal, you know, type uh, events that all seem to have overlap. Yeah. And I mean. When you deal with, okay, like ghosts, you have uh, poltergeist accounts, which a parapsychologist will tell you is our unconscious mind, especially especially attributed to like uh, girls around just just around uh, puberty who are under a lot of stress, although that's that's a small portion of it. That's not like all poltergeist cases, but it does seem to revolve around people who are seem to be putting out energy. Um, and then, uh, oh, what's his name? I could never remember this guy's name. He wrote a book called Illuminations, showing how mass poltergeist or mass UFO sightings 
mimic the behavior of poltergeist sightings, but with lights in the sky. And that led me to realizing that when people go out in the woods looking for Bigfoot and they're getting knocks and stones thrown at them and mimicry and stuff like that, that, hey, this is also, this is, this is a poltergeist in the woods. Right. It's the trickster aspect of the, of the, of the poltergeist, yeah. you know, phenomena. Exactly. Or, or it's giving you what you expect in different environments. Yeah. And, you know, it, I think another part of that, that binary choice, some of that, that uh, programming was ingrained in the, even in the terminology, you know, unidentified flying object or now, you know, uh, un- uh, what is it? Uh, UAP. UAP, right. You know, aerial phenomenon. Yeah. And it, so it's don't worry about, you know, what you're experiencing in your bedroom or, you know, it, it, anything that's going on around you. You've got to worry about those things in the sky that may or may not be from some very distant planet. And, you know, maybe they exist or maybe they don't, but they're way out there. So even if they did, it doesn't really matter. Right. right. There's nothing if they're not altering our uh, day to day life. And I think that's that's that bait and switch mentality. There's that. And, and you know, the one of the other issues I find uh, tends to be that you had researchers who were using hypnosis on people, and we now know that hypnosis is not a good memory recovery tool. So what have we implanted in them? What, 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 what have we created that's not really there, but then people start seeing it because that's what they're expecting to see? Yeah, that, that's one thing that the, the phenomenon has been has a, it's it's almost a, you know it's a feature not a bug of the phenomenon that its ability to constantly uh, present itself based on the level of understanding of this of you know society at any given point I, as you notice increasingly you know not this is something that you know I don't know that people that have not studied the phenomenon recognize of how uh, there are different like different time periods perceived the same phenomenon in different ways. And I think now, like, for example, we're starting to hear references um, to this is that this explanation might be that it's some form of advanced AI, right? Of course, because we're developing AI now. So we're, we're starting to, to do that overlay again. We're overlaying our, our, you know, level of technological sophistication on top of something we don't understand. Yeah. And you know, it's also being, you know, as you said, messed with by disinfo a lot. Um, speaking of which, uh, I have here a book release for Lou, Al- Lou Alizondo, which says the Roswell crash site, the Phoenix Lights, Areas 51, sightings, conspiracies, glimpses of the unexplained, decades of questions unanswered. Forget what you think you know about unidentified flying objects. On the 25th of June, 2021, the Pentagon released a historic report confirming 144 incidents of unidentified aerial phenomena without any easy explanation. The U.S. Navy and uh, Air Force have confirmed ongoing sightings of bizarre objects moving at blinding speeds, often around the uh, nuclear and defense sites. Barack Obama has publicly acknowledged this concern. Louis Elizondo has spent an accomplished military career hunting drug traffickers and terrorists before being posted as the director of the government's highly sensitive advanced aerospace threat identification program in 2008. In that capacity, Elizondo has an international, led an international ed- uh, man effort to uh, study UFOs in the world. Uh, shocked by what they found, Elizondo has commanding officers, told his commanding officers, the world needs to know the truth. When Elizondo's superiors refused, he resigned his post in order to go, uh, and it's over the, oh, go public. Since then, he has led global disc- the, uh, the global disclosure effort. And then it says, are we alone? Are governments in possession of wreckage? What do we know about science and tech of UAPs? Have UAPs compromised nuclear weapons caches? What's inside a UAP? Where... Where do UAPs go between sightings? Do they have a base or are they amongst us? Um, and the biggest question of all, who are they? As a civilian and high level national se- with high levels of national security clearance, Elizondo is wildly viewed as the world's most credible authority on UAP and UFOs. This memoir reveals groundbreaking, even shocking details of ATIP, uh, of what ATIP learned and the profound implications, not just for humanity, but for everything we think we know about our lonely place in the universe. (laughs) 
I try not to put my chips down on uh, on opinions of people without just I, I I prefer to sit back and watch, right? Yeah. In other words, let's say, you know, hypothetical scenario. Let's say the book is full of information that's all counterintelligence, right? Within that counterintelligence, there's going to be some certain percentage of factual information in some part that's designed to lead people astray. I since it's very difficult to determine what is going to be of value. I generally prefer to just take it all as data and see how that compares against the historical record. Is there, does some of it fit patterns? The part that doesn't fit patterns is most likely not factual, unless it's some new bit of information that, you know, is some isolated thing that, that you know, is, is more contemporary. Mm -hmm. Even then, I, you know, I, I, I prefer to, to look for the patterns. Yes. Oh, so, so do I. Um, and yeah, they're, they're always going to mix a little bit of truth with, with the nonsense. But I feel like even reading that, you know, oh, he, uh, he, he was a high, high, you know, had a high security clearance and just told his officials, screw it. I'm just going to go public because, you know, yeah, that happens. Never. You're not you're not going to go to jail for that or anything. <laughs> it's exactly like I said a little while ago, when somebody tells you that they are that they know what's going on. That's when, you know, they're lying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is. You know, I, 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 I'm not even, you know, with all, I mean, hundreds of books that I've studied on, on this, and I am still not convinced that they know what they're dealing with. No, no, absolutely not. Um, and that's you know, the thing. One, th- one point in that, I, I want to point something out just because you brought that up in that, or you mentioned that it was stated in the, in that little blurb there. And this is something that I think people need to recognize for, for people that might, you know, Probably most of your listeners are on board and understand that this is a reality and not some, you know, fantastical myth. But, right. you know, just based on, you know, the, the acknowledged unexplained sightings in this report, of course, you know, of course, we're talking about this was um, that that report was limited. I think they began their investigation in 2004. So it was sightings from 2004 to 2021. And of that, there were 143 unexplained sightings. But all of those sightings were of Navy enlisted personnel. So if you take, I I actually ran some numbers. The average enlistment runs about 350,000 people. So if you take an average of 350,000 enlisted personnel over that time period, it turns out that 0.0004% of enlisted personnel had unexplained sightings, right? Yeah. So that's fine. That sounds like a small number, but now let's apply that number to the U.S. The population of the United States: three hundred and thirty million. Point zero 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 four percent of three hundred and thirty million is one hundred and thirty-two thousand unexplained sightings. You know, so you know that they, they, you know, oh, it's only one hundred and forty-three. Well, you know, how many is a concern? Is right, it one, you know, right. is it a hundred? Is it a thousand? Or is it one? Well, you know, you figure even. <laughs> Even Project Blue Book, when it came out, never said that there's that UFOs aren't a real thing. They just said that they don't pose a threat to national security. Absolutely. That that that's something, you know, and you see it because you've been you've been researching this a long time that you have to you have to like really dissect their statements. Yeah. Very often they're saying one thing that gives a certain impression. But in reality, they're same thing, saying something completely different. You know, it the the interpretation can be is purposely deceit deceitful you know what i mean it's 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 worded to lead you to believe something when in reality they're actually seeing something because they don't necessarily want to lie bold yeah. face lie not that they don't do it but g- in general they can they want to always leave that plausible deniability oh yes we never said that <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> especially when you see it in writing you know what when, when you when you can hear it, you know, and you can hear the inflection, that's, it's a little bit different than when you're actually reading the statement. Whoa, well, that, that, you know, that could be interpreted entirely different. Well, then you, then you have the, the other side of it where the media wants to just kind of uh, ridicule it and they still do it. Uh, not quite as much as they used to, but you had uh, that, that bomber that the, the air force came out and said, yeah, a bunch of these very high altitude UFO sightings in like the fifties or whatever. Were this bomber and the art in the media is putting out headlines. Ah, oh, UFOs explained. Yeah, that was the CIA's explanation for UFOs. They were saying that it was the the uh, overflights of the U two. Was it the U two? Okay. The, the, yeah, it was the U two. And I'm like, okay, let's consider the logic. We, 
Lockheed designed and built this top secret aircraft to overfly, you know, the Soviet Union. Yeah. That was, in theory, undetectable. But now they're telling us that the public was seeing these things. They fly, fly at 70,000 feet. When you see an airliner, like the ones that you can barely see way, way up high, you know, the ones that are flying, you know, across the country or, inter, you know, it, intercontinental those are flying at like thirty thousand feet right well I, you're not gonna see an aircraft at seventy thousand feet the the article i was reading said that what would they, it was talking about just the, the the like pilot sightings that who were already flying at high altitude seeing it and they would see glints of light and stuff occasionally and be like oh what's that and it turned out to be that that bomber but it never said anyone from the ground could see it yeah well, even then you know figure that a a, a commercial airliner flying at 30,000 feet, that U-2 is higher above that commercial airliner yeah. than the commercial airliner is over us on the ground. <laughs> so, I mean, come on, you know, and what would, if you were up that high, what would you think? You're a pilot, you're, you're, you fly all the time and you see this dot of light. Let's say you're, there is a, a sun glint off of it or something. What are you going to think? You're going to go, well, yeah, it's a satellite. Yeah. You're not even going to stop for a second to think about it. It's you're just in order. It's not even going to cross your mind that oh, that's a UFO. No, it's just a light. It's nothing. You know, I don't. I myself don't put a lot of stock in in lights in the sky sightings because again, those can could be anything. Yeah. Especially yeah. in you know modern days because we yes. we don't truly know what the state of the art in aviation is. Nope. There are very likely things flying around. You know, including potentially the Tic Tac UFO that are cutting edge, you know, aerospace. They're not necessarily, you know, alien or, you know, <laughs> interdimensional machines. They could very possibly be our own technology. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, those are not the, those are not the type of, of, you know, incidents that really grab my attention. I, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned about the guy that has the up close and personal experience and al alters his life and, yes. you know, those kind of things. Well, I, I, I feel like the nature of this phenomenon in general, however it represents itself, seems to be almost shamanic in our lives if we let it. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, and the thing is, because a lot of times it manifests negatively, people are like, well, if it's shamanic, it would be helping us. But sometimes we, we need that negativity to, to grow through. I mean, when a, when a shaman actually undertakes that path, it's not all love and light like, like some new age people might think uh, and present things as it's. It's tough. You're dealing with with a lot of tough stuff that you have to overcome. No, I mean when you uh, you let's say you're out in the ocean and you 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 catch a dolphin and you tag it, you know that that dolphin might think, oh, these things are evil. You know these these creatures on that machine are evil and they're you know they're hurting. Yeah, you. But yeah. in reality, our our intentions is something out completely outside of the realm of understanding of that you know, of that dolphin or whatever, you know, you can apply that to just about anything. So there, this is where, if we're truly talking about something that is non, you know, non-human intelligence, it is virtually impossible for us to apply any sort of like rational rationale to it. it, it you know, it's in its purpose is intent and purpose could be completely outside of any experience, you know, human experience. Yeah. And that's the thing. Sometimes I think this stuff is we have no paradigm for it. So we have to match it to something that's at least close. Um, or, or we, um, you know, like, like, especially like one-off monster encounters. I always find that interesting because obviously like where you can say, maybe there's an undiscovered ape in the Himalayas or, uh, in, uh, the Pacific Northwest, because there's vast swaths of place of land there that people have never been in. So maybe there's a small population of undiscovered apes. Uh, when you're dealing with, I don't know, uh, New Jersey, it's a little harder to say that that that's a a probable uh, solution to this, and it gets. But I, I mean, but that's a bigfoot. But when you get a monster, a one-off monster encounter, like there's there's no reason that should be a physical thing. So I think sometimes our brains encounter this stuff and has have no idea what to make of it. And you know, our brains rolodex flips through and goes, I don't know what this is. Thus, it's scary because it's an unknown. Uh well, what's scary? Monsters are scary. Oh my God, it's a monster. Yeah. And you know, some of it could be, it's some of it could also be active um, deception. In other words, oh, the yeah. Yeah. Per perceptual uh, manipulation of our perception, because there are many, many ca cases of people who have had um, experience where, you know, let's say multiple parties involved in an, in a, in an experience 
a sighting or some some type of UFO. Let's just say yeah. it's a UFO sighting where people standing side by side have vastly different interpretations of the event. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking not only the descriptions of what they observe, but even very, very significant differences in the amount of time that they believe that the experience took place. You know, some people say, oh, well, it was, you know, 30 seconds. The other guy go, no, it was 10 minutes. Right. You know, right. like, and there are examples like, well, like, for example, um, Survivor Man, that Les Stroud. Yeah. He's had, he's, I've heard him talk about experiences that he's had where there were UFO sightings or orb sightings and then Bigfoot encounters. Right. Right. And that's the thing, you know, um, Tim Renner, who was a flesh and blood guy at first, I mean, he started asking people when they would report Bigfoot things, they're like, so... Has anything else weird been happening? Like, did you see weird lights in the area? Have you been having sleep paralysis, uh, poltergeist activity? And people would be like, oh, well, yeah, but what does that have to do with Bigfoot? Exactly. Yeah, that that happens so much. People separate, you know, I get, I'm, I'm sure you do too, but I get a lot of people that will approach me, people that you would never, ever expect to have any interest in any sort of paranormal type phenomena. And in a private setting, they'll say, you know, I don't usually tell anybody or I've never told anybody this before, or I've never even told my family about this. And they'll tell me about some experience. And it invariably, it is something that's really strange. Yeah. And, you know, um, I'm trying to remember in which book Jacques Vallée has this. He He's in one of his books. He, he presents this this concept. And I think he calls it the hilltop graph. And he talks about how. There are reporting biases in society that like the average person, let's say, walks out and sees a light in the sky. They probably won't tell anybody like it's not a it's not a significant event. Right. You know, it's not profound that they feel that they need to tell somebody. And then as the events get stranger or, you know, you get into that, oh, I saw a structured craft thing. They may tell their family or they may tell close friends. And then when it's a bigger type event, they may disclose it publicly. But there's a certain point where they crest over where that graph drops off when the, when the incident becomes truly strange. Yeah. When you get into that paranormal stuff, they won't tell anybody. Yeah. It'll be, it could be decades before they ever bring it up to someone. And, and I think one of the things that has, has also changed, I know my view of this has changed, um, is that it used to be if someone reported multiple things happening to them, you'd be like, well, okay, they're just making it up. Whereas now I find it odd if someone just had one thing happen to them. Like if you've had one, you've probably had others. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, it's a lifelong thing and, and yeah. they could be, they could be subtle. Like I'm, I'm not necessarily saying, oh, you know, you're having, uh, you know, beings in your bedroom or you know, yeah. structured craft over your house. A lot of times they're subtle things, the synchronicities or knowing things you shouldn't have known or yep. the voice. That's another very, very common one. Um, I, the, you know, the, the voice. And sometimes people think, oh, well, that's just my inner voice. I'm like, yeah, but sometimes that inner voice tells you things you might not have known or you're yeah, really no yeah. way you could have known. Well, that, so, that, that you know, voice, there, that voice there is... are books on that, just on that subject alone. Really? Uh, that that voice is how I got the name Soraya. Really? Because it was spoken yeah. into my head very loudly, and it was definitely not my inner voice. <laughs> um, I have some experience. I, I don't generally. I, I, I this is funny because I I try to maintain some some you know illusion of objectivity. <laughs> I guess in this, uh, but I have experiences with exactly what you're talking. Mul multiple varied types of exactly what you're saying. <laughs> So, so, so tell us a little bit about those. I, again, I, I usually don't, I don't like talking about it because I think that it could, um, uh, sometimes, uh, you know how it is. I guess I, this is, this is an example of the hilltop graph. <laughs> <laughs> this is beyond the crest. <laughs> well, I think I have heard you talk about these before. Well, I've, you know, I have mentioned, uh, a very young, uh, uh, an incident that happened when I was very young. I actually did have, uh, uh, you know, a sighting of, uh, a craft and beings mm -hmm. and the, the strange part for that. And that honestly, that more than anything, that because keep in mind that I did not connect a lot of these different types of phenomena until m much later in life. Sure. But early on, it was that particular particular one as a as a young you know young child that stuck with me because of for a very unusual reason I would say. 
it wasn't so much the fact that I saw structured craft and beings around it. It was the fact that where, I guess I should explain, just back up a, a, right, a bit, okay. just to say, I was I was uh, uh, in bed at my grandmother's house, which is on the top of a hill, two-story house, big backyard with big trees. Behind that, there was a big uh, field and a big parking lot and everything. And I, I'm a, I wake up in the middle of the night by this bright light. I get up and I look out the window on the second floor and I can see back there and I see this disc shaped craft with these small beings. Uh, as I remember, they were in silver suits. I mean, just stereotypical stuff. Right? right, right. You know, to the point of absurdity. But so I see the and I had no I mean, I was pretty young, so I really had never been exposed to that kind. Of, I did like like horror movies and things, but never. I don't think I'd ever really seeing anything like that right? and on in movies or television right? and so i see these things and i watch them for a little while and i just go oh wow that's cool and then i went back to bed right <laughs> which is really unusual in hindsight like yeah that it's a pattern but what bothered me for years and years after that was the fact that i could very vividly remember what i was seeing but i'm like i should not have been able to see that where the trees in the backyard were, that should have, they should have obstructed my view of mm. where the craft was actually sitting. I'm like, something's not right here. Like my memory is either flawed or I dreamt it or anything, but I'm like, no, this was like, I was awake. Like as I was sitting, it wasn't like a dream. And, but I, I had that doubt and that yeah. doubt actually sent me on this journey to try to figure out what was it. Hmm. Yeah. The answer is. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know when I figured out. <laughs> Obviously, after that, years later, I would say, well, I don't even know of his years. I, there, there are aspects of it that I don't even really honestly understand. Beyond other stranger aspects that I don't understand. But there were other things that happened throughout my life that I never associated with that. Yeah. That I knew were strange and definitely far out of the ordinary, but things related to the voice and things like that. But I never made the connection until much later. Again, stepping away from stepping away from the research and kind of straightening my head out and then coming back into it with fresh eyes uh, and being more open to all the data rather than, you know, we ha as and you, you probably are, you know, have experienced this years as well. You 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 will find a niche within the phenomenon that you has you have an interest in. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's a certain aspect. Let's say it's it's uh, uh, abduction or cattle mutilations or whatever. And you, you you kind of focus on that. And for me, it was like the triangular UFO sightings. That would they mm -hmm. were that was a big area of interest for me. So what happens is you start looking for that thing and you start filtering out everything else. Yes. And you're you know to me that you lose all your objectivity when you do that. And that's yep. where you have to step away and just come back and look at it uh, at a clean slate and my, look at all the data. My, my, my goal has always been, been to throw out the assumptions. Uh, there, there was a, in one of uh, Whitley's books, he talks about, and it's one of the ones where he first starts connecting it to death. Uh, it might've been uh, solving the communion enigma. Uh, he talks about these people who saw this large fireball just move slowly over their neighborhood. And as the thing is, is you know, just starting to disappear or whatever, their son comes downstairs and says he was just visited by their dead son and he wanted to tell them that he was okay. And I went, why are we, you know, like we look at this as, oh, that's a UFO. What is What does UFOs have to do with the dead? But then I look at it and go... Let's throw all that out for a minute. What if there's something going on that's allowing both this fireball to be visible and a visit from the dead? You know, like like a certain certain energy affecting consciousness, a certain energy coming from the earth or hitting the earth that is allowing, say, a plasma ball to to suddenly appear. And at the same time that that's happening, it's affecting this kid's consciousness enough that his dead brother is able to get through to him. Yeah, that that is an area that just is not very well recognized. And I, you know, I get it. It's weird. And probably most people, you know, it's just a bridge too far for. Yeah. I, I understand yeah. that. Yeah. But, you know, I think um, I don't know if we discussed this last time, but that documentary uh, Witness of Another World. Yes, that's great. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Juan Perez is a good example of that exact thing. He has 
your stereotypical UFO encounter, and he meets his deceased grandfather. Yeah. And has a conversation with him and sees relatives and things, and then comes back and has this a new ability that you know he can see people, other people's death. Yeah. You know, and just and you think, oh, well, that's you know that's ridiculous, but you this documentary does a very good job of convincing you that no matter what this guy really believes, it ruined his life. You know, yeah, he, yeah. he isolated, he spent his entire life by himself because he doesn't want to see, he doesn't like meeting people because he says when he touches them, he sees their death. He doesn't want to associate with people. And, and that, you know, that also part of the issue there is he had no paradigm to, to kind of work with, with that. And until he was reunited with his, his, uh, his original, you know, where he came from. Uh, yeah, he. He interpreted the the object as he said a tractor or a hut. Yeah, he didn't know what a UFO was. So the but what I'm saying is that it was actually a healing experience once he had a paradigm to work with. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's that's what we're lacking in our culture because we're we're keeping it in this sort of sci-fi, you know, space alien sort of thing. Yeah, you know that, and that's that kind of kind of for me it kind of brings me back to that thing we were talking about earlier about how we perceive this in different ways and how people have a tendency of taking the phenomenon at face value. And you'll have people yeah. say, Oh, you know, we know they're this, or we know that they're that. And because, and you ask them, well, how do you know that? Well, they told us, yeah. they said, Oh, we're, you know, we're time travelers or we're this or that. I'm like, what makes you think that could be that they're telling you the truth, <laughs> right? You know, that, that the false prophecies and all that are a, a part, a major part of this, the, you know, you, and that's, we we did an episode on that, on all the contactees that, you know, were receiving messages through automatic writing and mm -hmm. these kind of things. And they're all receiving very similar messages and they're often, you know, told to do things and they'll, they'll get predictions and the predictions will come true. You know, take, for example, the Gulf Breeze 6 was a very very, I guess, a more modern, I guess, from the '90s uh, incident where, yeah. where these military personnel all, you know, leave their base and because they believed the apocalypse was coming because they were, they had these encounters that were actually initiated through a Ouija board, but they ended up being UFO experiences, and they're told there's going to be, you know, an apocalypse, and they they defect from from uh, their base in Germany and end up in Gulf Gulf Breeze, Florida, and you know, it's this very weird thing. And why? Because the whatever they were communicating with was giving them predictions, earthquakes and things like that. And they came true and it yeah. convinced them. And then they go all in and then they're deceived. Yeah. Um, and what happened to those guys? I mean, I assume they got like court martialed or something. No, that's even gets that's a very weird part of the story. Um, I don't have, uh, you know, I, I wish I had my notes in front of me because that, that is a really interesting ending to the story. Um, they were all, uh, apprehended mm -hmm. and, you know, we're going to be court-martialed. They were, they were taken, they were, um, and while this, while they were locked up, you know, within a day or two, I think of this happening, the media received a letter from someone, some, and I don't remember how they identified themselves, but they said, we have the pictures, we have the tape, release the Gulf Breeze 6, or we will release the information. They were pardoned. Huh. They never, after that, they were, they were interrogated and everything and they were, they were pardoned. Now there's more to the story is, as, well, as there usually is, they, it turns out that somehow they actually, the intelligence community actually knew they were going to defect. Of course. They were following them, but they supposedly lost them in the airport, which I find that hard to believe. But yeah. And there's more to the story. I'm actually going to be adding more to the story soon. <laughs> okay. In an upcoming episode, there's, I've, you know, I've been digging into all this stuff and there's always more and nothing, nothing is ever as it appears. Oh, no, absolutely not. Especially if, when you start doing anything with the military. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it is a very interesting case, but, you know, in that, in that episode, I also talk about, you know, Dorothy Martin and, and the seekers who, you know, she was told there was going to be a mass landing and same thing. She was given information that panned out. There were witnesses. These things actually happen. And then, you know, she's told there's going to be this mass mass landing and the media shows up and everything and nothing happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, that goes back to the Mothman you know? prophecies, too, where, you know, Gil had all these accurate predictions. And then what 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 was the the one that ended up with the bridge collapsing? There was going to be a, 
a blackout or yeah, something at Point Pleasant. Yeah, the bridge collapsed and people were killed. And the thing is that the phenomenon was was toying with him. It was literally like calling him, leaving, you know, telling him over the phone, joking about, you know, because supposedly there was going to be, you know, he was it kind of led him to believe that there was going to be some type of a bombing or something. Yeah, that's what it was. And and he had he got water. He was carrying jugs of water in his car in case there was no water and all this. And and the phenomenon even, you know, or whatever this was, calls him and tells him, you know, what are you going to do with all that water and stuff? It's just really strange. It's that 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 whole incident is stranger than most people could ever accept. But at the same time, wasn't some of that Gray Barker just messing with him? Um, I think that part comes in um, related because supposedly there were um, men in black sightings. Okay. And I think that's where the Gray Barker stuff kind of spills in. As far as as far as Keel's actual experiences, I, you know, he he I think I have, you know, my inclination is to believe that he really experienced it. Now, what was behind it? That's more, much more difficult to ascertain. Yeah, but yeah. I don't know. I just I, I I know that Gray Parker admitted to you know making prank phone calls to Keel and stuff, uh, just to just to mess with them. Uh, but I don't remember the time period that that fell into. Um, yeah, because Gray Barker was kind of the Men in Black guy. You know, he was. Yeah. And wh- what do you think of that? Like the Men in Black? Do you think there's anything to it? There are lots of lots of cases that are truly hard to, to hard to explain. Um, I'm trying to think of the name of the, the researcher, um, uh, burn, Bernhard, burn, oh God, what's his last name? Schwartz. Okay. Um, was a researcher. His case is pretty amazing. Um, some appear to be something beyond just the military trying to dissuade people from making reports. There are lots of, you know, and I know this is, you know, uh, Whitley Strieber talks about this a lot that, cases where there are that these men in black type, you know, seemingly non-human, um, whatever intelligences are paired off with others. And he has, well, I guess he's met some of you that were like allegedly, uh, supposed to be almost like, um, in, you know, training these to integrate into society and type. Oh yeah. yeah it's yeah. really strange. It, it's a, it's an area that I do, I do plan to, to do an episode on because I have been collecting reports. I actually have quite a few of them of some really strange ones that, mm. that make you scratch your head and go, what, what is going on here? Things that seem like, okay, if this was a, a government agency doing this, how, how did they do this? Like they knew things they couldn't possibly know or do things that just don't seem, you know, don't seem possible. Yeah. Just, it is a strange, it, it's just a strange facet. You know, it's, it's another one of those things. It's probably very similar to the, uh, the uh, cattle mutilation stuff that there is an, an, a certain percentage of it that is probably legitimately strange. And yeah. then other parts that are psyop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what uh, have you looked into the, the black eyed kid stuff, which seems to me to bear a lot of resemblance to the men in black. I, I have read a few stories about it. I kind of link that a little bit more closer to the, the shadow shadow people and and hat man type stuff mm, okay. kind of seems more along that line no, no, and I, I could see that, that. is real <laughs> that one i will say is real okay why do you say that um people i know have experienced it okay that i know are not lying okay i'll, I'll just leave it at that obviously these people have not shared their story then no 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 definitely not and these are people that no, well, knew nothing of this. They oh. were experiencing these kind of things where in ways that they had no, no idea what was going on. Right. And caused lots of turmoil for them. So they didn't, they didn't know what it was. They don't know how to, exact. there are other, um, related phenomenon that, um, you know, I, I've, I've actually brought this up to Alex Sakaris and surprisingly he had not heard of it. And I, I don't know why I assumed more people had heard of this phenomenon, but the black cloud stuff. Have you black ever heard of that? Stuff. I don't think so. It's actually referenced in a uh, wit- uh, witness of another world. Juan Perez saw it too. I know several people, like several people that have experienced this. Are we talking fog or just a, a literal black it's cloud? It's like an amorphous black cloud. Huh. that just ominous and no idea what it is. No, I, I couldn't even be. 
in the situations where this has been described to me, it's really hard to like wrap your head around what could this be? It's not it's not smoke. It's not like something was on fire or um, in in um what it can do is strange, hard to explain, going through walls and things like that. And I'm talking, I've heard stories firsthand from someone, from people that have have never told anybody about this, seeing this in broad daylight and things like that. Um, is it is it shadowy or does it look like actual like smoke? It looks like smoke. From the descriptions, it's like a cloud. I mean, because like that- a black cloud that to, to me that brings to mind descriptions of the gin there could be a connection between those i mean there's smokeless fire but there's also you know elements where you have the gym appearing as as basically that like clouds yeah and like i said uh, in in at least one case that i can think of of someone that i know that person described this as it went through a wall and they followed it and it was on the other side of like it went through the wall came out the other side oh, and continued on. Yes. Yeah. It's very strange. Like I said, I don't even, I don't know I, that I have not seen myself, but I know that it's real. I know because of the people that I know that have experienced it. I know it's real. They're not making it up. They don't know what it is. They don't have any, you know, they don't connect it to any sort of phenomena. They just yeah. said, I saw, I experienced this. I don't know what it is. And that's, they leave it at that. There was, but you see some of these people that I'm referring to have had multiple different of these different types of experiences, yeah. seemingly unrelated things. But why do these seemingly unrelated things keep happening to the same people? Well, and, that, and that's a good question. Like, do you think that certain people are more prone to this? Do you think there's, they're somehow selected out? Um, cause I, th- I think being prone to it is definitely part of it. Like people, some people are more sensitive the same way. Some people are colorblind and other people have, uh, hypersensitivity to color. Yeah. I think some people, you know, I think that may relate to this stuff that Gary Nolan talks about the you know, cognitive attainment, attainment that some people have more, um, connections in that area of their brain where they may have the ability to perceive things that the average person does not. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, we see such a small, um, you know, frequency of light. We are audio, you know, our audio ability to, you know, we hear what 20 to 20, you know, so we, we only hear a very small spectrum. So there, you know, and there are so many different things that we don't ever consider like, you know, um, you very often will hear people talk about like how, you know, we we communicate in different ways. How would we communicate with other species? You know, how ants, how would we communicate with an ant? An ant is incapable of understanding us and everything. Well, ants communicate through pheromones. Yeah. You know, um, so sometimes I wonder whether some of these things that we perceive are attempts at communication that we don't we don't have the tools to understand. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I mean, they, they, they can, whether or not they're from another planet, they could be from right here, but be so alien to us that we have no easy one-on-one communication. Right. They could be from everywhere. Yeah. They, you know, I, you know, that's the other thing that, you know, again, we talk, you know, I guess this relates also to what we were talking about earlier, how this perception of what the phenomenon looks like, like, oh, you know, it's gray aliens or it's gnomes or fairies or whatever it is like. And, oh, it's definitely this, you know, we see a pattern here. Like, well, what makes you think that we've ever actually seen what's behind it? Right. All of these things could be, you know, avatars or deception. Like, it's entirely possible that we have never actually experienced whatever is behind the phenomenon. Yes. And, you know, and when I look at commonalities for this stuff, lights are definitely one of those commonalities for all weird experiences. Lights are very common, as well as electrical effects, um, poltergeist activity. Um, so, I mean, light in some way might actually be its, its actual form. And then we're, we're either co-creating or it's choosing a form to appear to us with. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I think that that, that is definitely on the table. You know, I'm, I, I try to be as open-minded as I, as I can be, but I do have, you know, certain inclinations in terms of, and, and things like I, I'm, I'm skeptical of some areas. I'm not, I don't say it's impossible, you know, oddly enough, I'm not, um, I'm not in the physical aliens from another planet camp. Yeah. Oh, I'm not saying it's I. impossible, but it's not as if, if that is what we're experiencing, let's say some aspect of what we're experiencing is that I don't think it's quite that cut and dry. Like, I don't think it's literally a, a being that traveled across the universe to get here. Right. 
I think if it is there, it's an avatar for something that might be across the universe that was created here or more in our, you know, vicinity. Um, because, you know, and I don't like to make generalizations, but interstellar travel like that is way more complicated than what people tend to make it out to be. A lot of times the, the inclination is people are, oh, we just, you know, if we could travel two thirds of the speed of light, it's like, that's, that's, that's only the beginning of, of it. Like the navigation and all the other thing, you know, yeah. is how do you not run into things? How do you set, how do you navigate at those kind of speeds? There's just so many problems. I just don't think that's the best way to do it. Like I just, that'd be like, imagine, you know, we had trains and we go, okay, we want to go across the ocean. We just need better trains. Like, right, no, right. You got to rethink this. There's got to be a better way, you know? Um, no, and, and the thing is, when you really look at it, when you, when, you, when you throw out the assumptions, you look at the stuff just as is, I feel like extraterrestrial is the least likely explanation. Yeah. Now, that, that's not, I agree, but that's not, that doesn't mean that I don't believe there's other intelligence in the universe. I think oh, there I probably is just tons. Yeah. And I, I just don't know that they're physically coming here. I also think there could be life in our own solar system. We just don't recognize it for that because yes. we're looking for carbon-based life forms. Realistically, I believe that what we may be dealing with is something that is effectively omnipresent. Yeah. It's everywhere all the time. Notice, yeah, again, you know, you look at like arguments for and against the extraterrestrial hypothesis. You go like, what are the chances that you can put intention into something and have the alien appear? Right, right. You know, you do your ritual and the aliens hear it from across the universe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just seems rather unlikely. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and you get people like, uh, like Stephen Greer who has, you know, what a list of all the different alien races that are visiting us. And it's like, why, why would they care about us? Like why would and they're all follow the same agendas and they all, you know, they're all, okay, we're not going to disturb them. Yeah. You know, we're going to, it's just, they're impervious to our, you know, viruses and, you know, germs and everything. They just, <laughs> it, they breathe our air and they act like we do and they're hominids. And, you know, just, I think we see what we want to see. I think it, or it presents itself in a way that we can relate to now. Yeah. What they go, well, that's not true. They don't look like us. They, you know, they're, you know, especially like you take gnomes, fairies, those kind of things. It's like, um, sometimes when you want to make a point, you need to do it in a way that sticks with somebody. You know what I mean? Yeah. The person that it had the experience needed to know that this was something important out of their ordinary life. And if this was just a person that did it, just a normal human that showed up and said something or did something or suggested something, you wouldn't put any stock in it. You know, what that, you know, mind your own business, buddy, or whatever, you know. But when this odd being does it, hmm, you're going to remember that. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't really thought about that before. Huh. Um, we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back with Marty Garza. Quick mid-show break and a recommendation. All right. Uh, so quickly, contact info. Everything can be found at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Uh, there's a contact tab. It has all the different emails. It has all our social media stuff right on the main page. Uh, everything from our Discord to our Twitter, or X as it is now for some reason, uh, Facebook group, Facebook page, everything. Everything is up there. YouTube channel. Um, if you have a story you would like to share, a uh, weird experience or whatever, stories at wheredidtheroadgo.com is the place to send them. Uh, also, the email to write if you just want to come on and talk about something that's happened to you. That's also where to contact. All right. Um, I also like to mention occasionally I do do another radio show called The Last Exit for the Lost, which is primarily a metal show. Um, well, it's a show with a metal heart. There's a lot of not metal stuff that gets played on it as well. What I, what I specifically aim for is stuff you're not going to hear very much in other places. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of metal, but there's also some eclectic weird stuff mixed in. If you like dark and heavy music, you may very well enjoy the show. And you can find that at thelastexit.org. And there's archives and all kinds of stuff there. Uh, as far as recommendations, I'm going to go with Mike Clellan's book, The Unseen, and uh, I will have him on. Actually, I think it's going to be myself, Miguel, and Joshua Cutchin, and we're going to talk about Mike's book and Joshua's book, but I highly recommend picking it up and checking it out. It is a very well-written novel. It's the first novel Mike has written, and uh, it's, it's what you'd expect from Mike, really. The main character is a painter. 
uh, likes to spend time outdoors. I mean, it's obviously modeled a little bit after Mike. Um, there are owls, there are UFOs, there are, well, something like UFOs. And I'm not going to spoil any of it. It's an, it's an interesting tale. Uh, and it sounds like he has more to tell of that particular story as well. And we'll talk to him about that, like I said, on the show, probably sometime in December. All right, uh, back to this show. Here you go. You're listening to Where Did the Road Go? And I'm here with Marty Garza, uh, who has done a whole series of shows on the UFO phenomena, for lack of a better term, uh, on the Brothers of the Serpent podcast. Do you know what part you're up to over there? Is it like 13 or something? Um, part 12, I believe, 12? is the okay. one we've done last. Yeah. You know, we've, been del- we've been delving into different aspects. You know, I'm trying to gradually like peel back the different layers of the onion, you know, and show people how it's not as simple and cut as dry as, you know, even, you know, I I like, for example, we, we did a recent episode that was, um, very, uh, heavily, you know, focused on MK ultra and, 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 you know, government, uh, intervention in different aspects of the phenomenon and, you know, and the psyops involved and you are, you know, and I had to, kind of give a disclaimer like i'm not suggesting that the phenomenon is not real but if you want to understand what's going on you need to recognize that this is a part of it yes uh like i said my my view is that we're dealing with numerous things that could look similar for so so you know uh especially when you're dealing with things like lights in the sky i mean there's there's a whole list of things that they could be including very exotically strange things right down to normal things that look weird. Um, you know, the same with monster encounters, ghosts, whatever. I think there's there's a possibility you're dealing with different sources that that come across similarly, the same way that like a a you can punch someone in a in a TV show or in professional wrestling and not really punch them but make it look just like someone really got punched, but yet they're two different things. Have you read um, Diana Pasolka's new book, no, Encounters. No. Okay. Well, I don't want to spoil it for you. <laughs> I don't there know. Was, there, I, I've never read her first one. I'm, I'm not really not sure what to make of her, to be honest. It's it's not it's not written for us, right? It's it's written for the general population that is, tr- and it is trying to introduce. A, I, I can relate to it. Okay. I guess so. That's kind of my my point here is that. I'm trying to convey on on our series. I'm trying to convey a very difficult concept. It's there's a lot of resistance when you start suggesting that the phenomenon encompasses all these other weird, you know, you know, communication with the dead and things like that. Right. You know, there are a lot of people that are very resistant to that. And so, you know, my method is rather than making outlandish statements like that, like I just did, I, uh, I start by just presenting stories like historical background. And I, I, you know, the intention is to allow the listener to make up their own mind, right? Draw sure. their own conclusion. Sure. So I, so I try to present all this data and it's just data and some of it, just like anything else, some of it might be completely factual and some of it might be misinterpretation or anything, but just take it in and look at how it lines up with other stuff. Like you're not going to understand my perspective from listening to one or two episodes. It's not, it's just, that's, those are only very small facets of a very complex scenario. I, I used an analogy. Actually, we actually we actually had a Patreon episode, and I was trying to think of a way to convey this. And um, I used an analogy of the Great Wall of China. I get, I tell this little allegory of um, this. Somebody writes a message across the entire Great Wall of China, right? And all these different all these different villages along the the wall, you know, they wake up one morning and they see this message. What does it mean? What does it mean? You know? And they're all reading what they can see from their village. And every village had a different interpretation. Right. And because they were only reading their section of the wall. Mm-hmm. And and you know it and I say, you know, and then you know at the culmination of this story, there's a kid standing standing there and he's listening to all the adults, you know, argue about what this story means or what the, and you know, what this, what this text across this giant wall is means. And he's sitting there pointing and nobody's paying attention. He's pointing and he's pointing at a mountain and he's like, you know, or stand on the mountain and read the whole freaking message. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you, you know, you, you were looking, we tend to look at the phenomenon through a keyhole. Yes. Yeah. And that's been going on with all the, all these varied phenomena for, you know, at least a hundred years. Yeah. I'd say even more, at least 
I would say at least 500 years. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and that kind of, I guess it's, uh, this isn't much of a spoiler, but one of the, one of the things that it was new to me, uh, part of it, but, but uh, one of the things that, that Dana Pasolko talks about in the new book is that um, Jacques Vallée and J. Allen Hynek were both Rosicrucians. Oh yeah. Yeah. And J. Allen Hynek was actually agnostic or I, you know, he was definitely not religious until he started investigating the phenomenon. Have and you, that connection for me is like you have to that probably doesn't mean a lot to to most people. But again, you look at the big picture, and you're like, OK, where did Rosicrucianism come from? Yeah. And you look at the connections to John D and Elias, Elias Ashmole and the Freemasons and I'd like, wait a minute, that's. That's interesting. There's something, maybe there's something there because now we're getting into, in other words, they are closet esoterics. You know, they, they are looking at the occult side of the phenomenon. Yes. Yeah. And that's something, again, that, that when I first noticed those connections with what I was doing, what Strieber was experiencing, and I was like, why has nobody made these connections before? And of course, the, I'm sure people had, but it wasn't really getting any notice because, you know, these are two, to most people, these are two very different things. If you're practicing magic, you're not, you're not interacting with UFOs. Yeah, absolutely. You're, they're looking through that keyhole. Yeah. Now, like they didn't lean over far enough to see that, that bit of data in the corner over there that might be really important to the overall picture of what's going on on the other side of that door. Yeah. Um, and I mean, Graham Hancock goes there in Supernatural too, where he starts talking about the connection between shamanic practices, altered states of consciousness, and UFO encounters. Yeah, that our our most recent episode um, was um, it goes <laughs> in a very very long roundabout way, getting into other forms of contact, and you know, through in this case, you know, we. I, one of the major points was through the use of mushrooms in shamanic, shamanic practice yeah, and how the shaman were using these mushrooms to communicate, to, to go to the other side and bring back information. And these are very, very ancient practices. The, um, you know, and I mean, they're written off by archeologists, first of all. And then you have the ancient alien people who are like, well, look, there's grays in our, our cave paintings. So clearly the only explanation could be ancient aliens. And it's like, right, but greys are also in altered states, you know, experiences with ayahuasca and mushrooms and stuff like that. So wouldn't that make more sense than ancient aliens? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, there was some, well, you know, I guess it's it's this, you know, um, I guess omnipresent. And for, from my perspective, I, you know, my working hypothesis is that it's this omnipresent intelligence that was communicating with them just like it is with us, you know, and it it's feeding somehow or another. It seems to be seeding, seeding technology to advance mankind. And that raises its own questions. Like, why is it trying to help us? What is it? You know, it's, it, you know, and that, of course, has its, you know, connections to you know the book of enoch and yeah. you know the the watchers giving technology to mankind but it you it know? also seems to be seeding religious beliefs at certain points too absolutely every and it's it's a one of those bitter pills to swallow but virtually every religion was started by some form of contact event and you know a lot of well, when you delve into them they're really strange yeah. there are a lot of them they're really strange if you look at them from a from a modern day perspective, you go, oh, those were UFO encounters. Right. But we have to be careful not to do the exact same thing that, you know, again, that you're you're putting this cultural overlay over it. You're viewing it for through a technological lens and now you, it looks a certain way. Maybe that's not it either. Maybe neither, you know, maybe looking at it from the religious standpoint is not is neither neither right nor wrong. Maybe we're just it's something we don't have um, the framework to really understand. It's yeah. something outside of our like experience. I mean, although we encounter it, it's outside of our understanding. What do you think of the idea of plasma intelligence? I think that that is probably effectively what we're dealing with. I think that the orb, which, you know, it's odd that when you look through historical, because I actually have done a bunch of research on that, like historical encounters with orbs, which very often were actually attributed to ball lightning. In fact, even, even Aleister Crowley had an, what they call it a ball lightning experience where a ball light really? you know, of this ball was in, in his room next to his knee. I don't and, remember that one. Okay. 
Yeah. Uh, you know, so I think that that might be um, if whatever whatever is attempting to communicate or, or influence mankind, if it's non-physical, it has the ability it appears to have the ability to bridge through to our physical realm. And and I think it's primary form is that in other words i have I, I i would tend to believe that that is it's maybe it's true form over the gray or the you know barrier angel or whatever it is right i think that it's very it's more likely to be that energy because you know if you look at the uh the uh the free foundation study the vast majority of encounters are with light you know light beings mm-hmm. far more than any sort of like grace or anything like that so that tells you and and then you have, you know, take like, for example, Ray Hernandez's case where he and his wife encounter this thing in their living room and she he sees it as a, like a U-shaped light and she sees it as an angel. They're both standing in, you know, essentially the same room staring at this thing and they perceive it in entirely different ways. Well, that's where I think the brain kicks in and, and is like, oh, we got we got to figure out what this is. We don't know. We'll throw something on it. Yeah. And he experienced the same kind of thing that I did. Like, oh, you know, that's nice. I'm going back to bed. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> you know, it's weird. You know, I, what's going on? Is that some form of like active jamming? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, maybe it's uh, maybe it's a form of altered state, too, because there's definitely there, there have been things. OK, so so like one of the experiences that, you know, there are numerous experiences I've had that creep me out after the fact but didn't creep me out at the time. And one of them was um, Ghost Hunters. I think the last time they did a live Halloween investigation where they went all night uh, and Grant was very obviously faking stuff. And it was it was bad. And I and I wrote an article about it at the time. And I was just like, man, this is there was the first thing that happens is he walks past a doorway and you hear what sounds like a cassette recorder with a motion sensor just kind of make this this noise. And then he's like, well, what was that? And he walks past the doorway and it makes the exact same noise again. And I'm like, Jesus, it even sounds like a recorder. Come on. And so like either that night or the next night, I am I wake up in the middle of the night and I'm sitting laying there awake. And from my closet, I hear a voice that sounds exactly like that. And it repeats itself twice. And I just stare at my closet and I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. So just because it sounds fake doesn't mean it is fake. And then I just went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and later I was like, why didn't that creep me out more? Like, why wasn't I like, what the hell? You know, I have young, younger daughters and they, you know, they're more of this uh, YouTube, you know, TikTok type, uh, uh-huh. you know, generation. And uh, they follow, they t- you need to watch this. You need to watch this. There's some, some YouTubers named, uh, I guess <laughs> I'm going to be in the minority here that uh, their, their name is Sam and Colby. Not a, I guess no they idea. have they have like 16 million followers. So wow. <laughs> I, I'm definitely the one on the wrong side of this. But regardless, they are they have this YouTube channel and uh, they like going to I guess they are into the paranormal. And right. they did this thing where they spent a week at the the conjuring house. OK. And my daughter's like, you got to watch this. You got to watch this. I'm like, oh, God, you know, I didn't think it was going to be worth. I was thinking it was going to be, you know, ghost hunters show yeah i have yeah. to say you watch it and it's pretty freaking creepy huh. like you watch it, it doesn't look staged they they truly look like they're getting the, you know getting scared <laughs> <laughs> like this is you know and they do some pretty wild stuff and it's it's definitely worth watching if you're into that kind of you know into the paranormal it's definitely worth watching and you know and if you've watched or or you know studied anything on on the, the conjuring story um, God, I can't think of the name. I've read his book. Um, there's a book by, um, one of the, he was studying to be a priest. Um, and he was, he was, uh, assisting the, the, uh, exorcist that was involved in the no. case. Okay. And he relays his experiences. <laughs> Man, that, that, that his, what he says happened to him are scarier than anything that's in the movies or anything like that. Well, the- it's really wild stuff. The uh, one of the girls who was you know living there at the time has written I think three volumes about all the weird stuff that happened to them in that house. Uh, I heard an interview with her and and they asked uh, you know well what about the movie and she's like yeah nothing in the movie was real. Yeah, she's like it was actually worse than what was in the movie, but nothing that was in the movie actually happened. And I mean the second one's the Enfield one, which which those you know they weren't even involved in. Yeah, there's a. 
there's a new I can't think of the name of it. There's a new documentary on Netflix about it as well. Uh, about um, which one? About the murder, the the son that um, one of the sons got possessed. Oh, Amityville. Um, no, no, the, no. It was in, in in I believe it was the Conjuring House. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. Um. Because there, I guess there's been more than one strange occurrence there, like more than one case. Which I can't which, think of the name of it. Which Jeez, also brings remember. brings back to like one of those common factors is that there are certain areas that seem to either record stuff really well, uh, especially trauma, or just are something different. Places like Skinwalker Ranch or whatever, or Sedona, that seem to have just a different energy to them. Yeah, in one of our episodes, we did a deep dive on Skinwalker um, on one of the Brothers of Serpent episodes, and um, I talked about this place that I think most people had never heard of. Is They refer to it as Colorado Ranch. Okay. Um, and uh, I I first read about it. There's It's actually in um, Timothy Good's book, uh, Alien Li- Liaisons, mm-hmm. but I actually found the APRO investigation. They actually did an investigation they made a report on it. And when you read that thing, it's actually weirder than the stuff that allegedly has gone on at, at Skinwalker Ranch. And it's it's not all that far away. It's in, you know, it's it's a ranch in Colorado. And I think I actually identified the location. Now, just recently, the daughter that of the owner of that place has come out. She's gone public with some of her stories now. Oh, okay. And it this this was in the 70s. This was way before anybody had ever heard of skinwalker ranch um you know and it is crazy i mean the things that happen there voices coming from the sky and you know different types of beings appearing in in the house and you know things all i mean everything you've heard at skinwalker and more cattle mutilations you name it it's Hmm. It's a really interesting story. I'll send you the I'll send you the APRO report on it. It's, okay, it's really cool. Wow. And then there's the that what was it? Oh, we 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 brought this up recently on the show, the Starlight Ranch, where the guy was claiming to kill Grays with a samurai sword. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's in Arizona, I believe. <laughs> uh, and, and then there's uh, there's one. I guess there there's going to be some one of these you know TV pseudo documentary type shows on. Uh, one is it blind frog ranch one in new mexico i think it is oh okay. also yeah there are places and then there's marley woods there's there are a number of yeah, what, relatively well-known places that have this jeff ritzman used to talk about marley woods a lot i'm not really that familiar with what's going on there similar very similar type things um marley woods are you know they've same thing they've observed you know odd beings you know uh wolf you know wolf bipedal wolves and things like that through you know through night vision you know scopes and things like that just very similar type phenomenon um where is one thing uh it's a secret oh um i believe it's in if i'm not mistaken it's somewhere in near illinois either in or near illinois okay uh but they don't want people going there so they've, they've managed to keep it pretty Pretty secret. Um, you know, the uh, Colorado ranch phenomenon uh, story has this weird thing that I have actually heard in other cases. And this is one of those pattern things because it's not it's not one of these well-known things, but it's strange that it turns up in certain cases where they talk about these boxes, these black boxes that look like they have almost like stars on them, mm. like little lights. And these things appear in, in, you know, in one of the instances, the, this Bigfoot creature is standing by the box and one of the alien looking, somewhat gray alien looking beings is talking to the owner. They're having a, a conversation and it tells him to stay away from the box. That yeah. The boxes are dangerous. Wasn't that Skinwalker? And, no, this was, no. At, okay. at, uh, this was at Colorado Ranch and the, the Bigfoot walks over to the box and touches the box and either dies or passes out. Right. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a Colorado ranch. Huh. <laughs> and these things have been seen to like go into the ground and just crazy stuff. Like what is going on here? Is this a psyop? Is this, you know, is this uh you know, testing LSD testing or what is it? You know, it's hard to say. Yeah. And that's the thing, like modern day stuff, especially is hard to say because I mean, even if someone catches saying on video, you're going, yeah, but look, look how easy it is to fake videos nowadays or photographs nowadays. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, that ship sailed video yeah. pictures and video don't mean anything anymore. They're not, I, they could really hardly be considered evidence. There are, there's a, there are a couple of, you know, of channels on, on Twitter, a couple of, you know, people that I see on there 
that are posting fake videos almost on a daily basis. You're like, why are they doing this? What do they get out of it? Well, they're getting like, hits. They, maybe, I but guess. You that's know? that's the thing. If, if you know how to monetize it, I mean, YouTube has, is filled with that crap. And they'll have a million views on it. Oh, Gray walking to its spaceship, you know? And half the people looking at it believe it. Yeah, that's why I try not to to pay too much attention. You know, obviously because I get questions about you know, oh, what do you think of the hearings and the, this kind. Of, so I have to stay you know abreast of of you know current events. But I don't really put a whole lot of like time into like oh, get let me get to the bottom of this this case of what really happened because there's just it's just too big of a gray area. There's too many potential explanations, you know, that I think that the looking at the historical cases, at least you have like, okay, well, you know, in the 30 years after this event, no additional information came out that might help explain it, you know, type thing. There's, yeah, it's, it's, they're, uh, they're more pure. Right. right. They're, right. I think that they're, and also, you know, effectively what I'm doing is I'm mapping out the activity over time and you'll see in in the like were there certain patterns that were short-lived that were only occurring in this particular period you know i'll give you an example i got into a, a, an argument with someone on twitter twitter which you would think i'd know better than this right <laughs> <laughs> but i learned very quickly I, I actually had just joined twitter not not long before this but uh someone was posting things about the green fireball sightings in, in New Mexico in, in the you know early 50s mm -hmm. and uh, late 40s, early 50s. And, uh, you know, and I, I made reference to the Life article, you know, have we visitors for space, had, a you know, a depiction of the green fireball over, you know, over the desert and all that. And I told the guy, I go, yeah, that was testing. <laughs> that was testing a boron fuel on V2 rockets. Oh, uh, you know, guy got all pissed off about it. I'm <laughs> like, I have, you know, what well, you think I haven't done my research. I'm like, dude, I'm not arguing with you. I'm, we're on the same side. I'm just telling you, don't waste a bunch of time on that. Right. You know, and he's like, right. oh, you know, Vin, you know, Lincoln La Paz, you know, investigated, I go, well, yeah. And who hired Lincoln La Paz? <laughs> do you honestly think he was going to out the people that were paying him to do the investigation? You know what I mean? This is an example of them perpetuating. They're using the UFO phenomenon to disguise their own activities. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You, know, you have to be able to discern these type of things. Yeah. But and there, you know, there are some people that every light in the sky is a UFO. Oh you know? yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I've told this story before, but I was driving down into Geneva, um, about a half an hour away from me, a fairly decent sized city. And I see this, uh, this light dropping weirdly from the sky and I'm going, the hell am I looking at? And after a few moments, I'm like, oh, it's a drone. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, you know, that's another good example there. You can get, oh, look at that light. It's doing, you know, it's defying gravity. It's doing all these crazy things. Like, have you ever watched a drone? Yeah. You yeah. know, if you have no frame of reference, you don't know how big or how far it aw away it is. And, you know, and again, not only that, but we, again, we don't know what cutting edge aerospace technology is today. Yeah. We may have craft that, that, that can perform that kind of, you know, stuff. So it's very, very hard, you know, at least when you're looking at the historical events, we have at least some reasonable idea of what the, the timeline of aerospace development, right. like in the past. But but generally, it's, you know, cutting, cutting edge technology is usually 25 years ahead of what the public is aware of. Yeah. So yeah. we really don't know. And it's moving so fast at this point that, you know, that, that, that 25 year gap 50 years ago is not the 25 year gap it is now. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I've, you know, I've, I've, one of my big, you know, points of contention with people is that, and I know this sounds crazy and I've gotten into numerous debates over it. And I generally, I go, look, look at, the, look at the data. There's, there's clear evidence of this, that I believe that, that a lot of these giant triangle sightings is actually military aircraft that was developed in the eighties yeah. under yeah. SDI. Yep. And it was the reason that they were kept secret is because I believe that Lockheed cracked nuclear fusion in the 80s or at least by the early 90s mm. and there are lots of signs to this i mean if you look at what lockheed is talking about in more recent years you know with over the last five six years they've been maybe even longer than that they've been talking about you know miniature nuclear you know compact or they, they refer to it as compact fusion reactors that will fit in the bed of a pickup truck 
Yeah. Like they're not talking about cracking fusion. They're talking about miniaturizing the technology. Right. <laughs> right. Know? And, and, you know, and there's, and that's, this, that's just the beginning. There's a huge amount of data behind uh, supporting the idea that this is a legitimate thing. Just look at the funding that went into SDI. How much money Lockheed got? What did they have to show for it? What have they produced? And yeah. keep in mind the F-35 and all these, those were sep- entirely separate programs. There's lots and lots of breadcrumbs that are painting a picture. And what we may be seeing, like with a Tic Tac, for example, we may be seeing the mature forms of those technologies that were developed under SDI in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we're out of time for the show, but we're going to, if you don't mind sticking around, we'll do a Patreon and continue this conversation. But where can people find you? I mean, obviously, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, you, you've been doing this series. Is there anywhere else people can, can uh, find you? Um, Twitter, I, 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 anything that's, you know, phenomenon related, I would say is I, I don't do it very much, but if I'm going to put anything online, it's generally on Twitter. If not, it's definitely on the, the podcast. I kind of, I keep my powder dry. I, uh, I, I very rarely want to disclose the, uh, the topics that we're going to be covering. I, everybody's always giving me a hard time over that because I try to be a little bit secretive because I, I don't want people to know where I'm going. I don't yeah. want them to know what, when I start laying out the stories, I don't want them to know. Like I, I like I want them to listen. Yes. Like, yeah. you know, people are like, get to the, get to the point, get to the point. I'm like, <laughs> it's like going, I go, if I go, if you go to the movies and I tell you how the movie ends, I just ruined the movie for you. Didn't I? Yeah. It's the same thing. And this way you get to experience it. And you get to draw your own conclusions rather than have me tell you what it is. Right. And that's the really important part. So, all right, cool. We'll continue this in the Patreon. And thank you for joining me for this part, Marty. Yeah, it was lots of fun. Where Did the Road Go is brought to you by our Patreons. And I'm going to give a shout out to all my Patreons right here because you really do help make this possible. And a special shout out to those pledging $10 or more. Greg Ross. Illuminati, Leanne Cherry, Matt in Delaware, Allison Cook, Super Inframan, 36 Dingo, Andrew Nichols, Matthew Sproul, Tim, Midnight Review presents Christine, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Guy Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Andrew Malone, Ann Witowski, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Bright Rectangle, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy and Communicable, CJ, Greg Parmenter, Diane B, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, History and Coffee, J, J Otto Bullet, Jack Huntington, James Lindsay, Jim and Sophie, John Mattingly, John Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Cool Kitty, Kristen L, Laser Printer Jam, Lauren McLean, Linda, Linz Jackson K, MJ Armstrong, Mark Brady, Mr. Weird, Ole Andre Olar, Paul Jeffries, Philosopher of Mirrors, Riker and Stark, Ron Dupre, Sam Sharon, Schmooples, Devourer of Mortal Souls, Stacy Sherwood, Stevie Norman, Strange Stories with the Seeker and the Skeptic Podcast, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Varosh K, Vincent Trewell, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, Ren Collier, Annabelle Smith, Caroline Walker, TDT Skunkworks, and Craig Sagastumi. Thank you all so very, very much. There's a lengthy Patreon segment to go along with this show with Marty, and uh, patrons will have already have that by the time you, the general public hears this, because uh, the shows also go up a week early for uh, Patreons as well. So if you want to become a patron, it's only $3 a month, and you get extra content every week, pretty much every week, sometimes more than once a week, and uh, you get the show a week early, and it helps us out a great deal. I want to welcome some new Patreons, Deborah Blair, Jad, Ari Sluter, and Wu. Uh, thank you for supporting us, and I hope you enjoy the extra content, and I will see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support. <laughs>